Our guest speaker is Joanna Detz. She's a publisher and co-founder of the environmental news website, EcoRI News. She's gonna speak to us about environmental justice stories that they've covered, um, especially those pertaining to water and watershed health. And so without further ado, Joanna. Hi, thanks Dory, and thanks everyone for, for, enter for having me. Um, always happy to speak about our work. Um, just quickly, um, as Dory said, we cover environmental news in, in Rhode Island and south southeastern Massachusetts, and we've been doing it for 10 years. So um, we've kind of seen the arc of some of these issues. You know, we're seeing progress on some fronts. Other issues are kind of stalled or um, uh, regulations have been rolled back. So I'm just going to talk um, briefly about four topics that we're covering. The first two are sort of long-term problems and then um, the last two are some solutions that have um, been elevated recently to address some of these long-term problems. So um, I know that you wanted me to speak to environmental justice communities and so um, really we've been focusing for quite some time on communities that border the Port of Providence, which is an industrial corridor along Providence's waterfront to the south of, of downtown. And um, it's home to all kinds of heavy industry, scrap metal yards, uh, LNG terminal, uh, coal pile sits there for part of the year. And it's right, right on the water. So as you can imagine, um, some of the pollution from this industry washes into the Narragansett Bay where, where the port sits. And um, in particular, there's one business, um, it's a, a scrap metal recycler that has been uh, given notice of violation and fines over the course of really a decade and has done next to nothing to, to mitigate its it's polluting ways. If Topher were on the call, he could speak more intelligently about this, but Save the Bay has been instrumental in bringing this issue to the forefront, um, advocating for stronger enforcement action. But that's just one example. Um, the reason that this is an environmental justice issue has to do with the neighborhoods that abut this area. Neighborhoods are situated quite close to this corridor and in addition to the air pollution that wafts over people are really concerned about a hurricane event um, or an intense rain event during a high tide that could inundate this area as we saw in Houston um, during the last hurricane I believe it was Harvey all the names are flooding together in my mind there have been so many um, you saw just what can happen when heavy industry floods and all of those chemicals are washed into neighborhoods nearby. And oftentimes those neighborhoods um, are comprised of people of color, recent immigrants, um, people who are lower on the socioeconomic rung and really don't have the, um, the political clout to advocate for solutions. They're really on the front lines of a lot of these problems. So um, it's a story that we've been following for some time. And as we have been um, following this issue, there are many community groups that have stepped in to advocate for themselves, which is, which is wonderful. And I think that um, coverage in general, media coverage has increased as a result. So people are paying attention more to this area, but as to any kind of mitigation, it's really gonna take money and political will um, to, to, change, to change the trajectory of some of this industry. Um, unfortunately, we just saw the approval of an LNG storage facility a new LNG storage facility in this area. And so it just continues to be a hot zone. So that's sort of, you know, it's, it's an area that certainly poses a challenge. And I think 
in the community, there's definitely will and strength. And as we continue to cover it and um, build relationships with people in those communities, hopefully a larger shot spotlight will be sh will be shown on on these particular issues and it will garner some attention. Unfortunately, you know, in Rhode Island, the General Assembly has not met this year. And so it continues just to sort of fester, um, which uh, unfortunately is the way of many big challenges. Um, the other challenge before I get to the happy, the happy stories and the solutions is um, uh, another long-term challenge, which sort of has a, a positive trajectory is the, the lead issue in Providence water. Again, um, the, the reservoir that supplies Providence, the Situate Reservoir, supplies Providence and nearly 60% of Rhode Island with um, drinking water. The source itself is um, it's not contaminated, but um, the problems really occur as the water is um, comes through pipes and service lines that are old or aging. So um, it's been documented that, it, especially in Providence, some of the older homes and the rental homes still have lead service lines and lead fixtures in the homes. So. This has been an ongoing issue and um, current, like it used to be that water customers had to pay for pipe replacements. And so that really left out a lot of people who are renting, um, renting property um, or, you know, obviously didn't own and landlords who just didn't want to invest in upgrading the service line coming into the house. So there is a new program that's putting some money towards replacing service lines on the property owner's side. Um, Providence is slowly replacing public service lines to homes, the lead service lines um, over the course of, you know, the next several years. It's, it's a slow process, but they did recently get some money to go towards this work. So really the challenge does come to renters and unfortunately that that's an environmental justice issue because many of those families or individuals don't own their own home and they're really at the mercy of the landlord to identify and fix the problems in the house. So there's there are, there are groups that are advocating for those um, those renters and just bringing awareness and attention to the issue of lead in drinking water. Um, let's see, I have the number here. I think it's, the number was like 28,000 private service lines and 11,000 public, private and 11,000 public service lines in the Providence water system contain lead. So it's a big issue and the city is slowly chipping away at it, but really, um, again, a lot of it is going to come down to some of those um, rental properties and whether landlords um, can get some of this money and have the will to fix the, the lead fixtures in the homes. So we're gonna continue to follow that story and update it as, as we move as we move forward and as that money comes online to fix some of these issues. Um, so I, I did want to also highlight some positive, <laughs> positive stories. Um, actually, October 3rd, there's going to be a celebration at the Roger Williams Park and Zoo. Um, recently, a coalition received some grant money to um, build a stormwater innovation center in Roger Williams Park. Um, Roger Williams Park is, I don't know how many of you have been there. It's, it's a big park right in, right in Providence. The zoo is there. And there are a number of ponds in the park that are severely impaired due to runoff from surrounding areas that it's a city. There are a lot of impervious surfaces. Um, nitrogen loads are really high. So um, the Stormwater Innovation Center project was created about a year and a half ago, I think, if I have that wrong, forgive me, 
um, but it invested in 40 projects to clean the polluted runoff before it enters the ponds in the park. So October 3rd, there's going to be a public celebration at the park, and there will be a tour of some of these stormwater innovations. So it's it's pretty cool to see that the park is really highlighting these stormwater improvements. I think sometimes stormwater mitigation is just not really sexy <laughs> to some people. I mean, to us, it's a beautiful thing, but um, so they're really bringing some attention and awareness to the innovations that they've done at the park to help uh, improve the health of the ponds there and reduce 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 public health threats that come with that pollution um, and sort of in tandem with that again this is all providence because um, I think when we talk about environmental justice a lot of times it's the urban communities that tend to be most severely impacted by um, some of these issues um, so the city of providence recently enacted a climate justice plan. Um, and it was really done um, by listening to people in the community. There was a concerted effort to keep out <laughs> the, the usual suspects. A lot of the environmental groups, you know, are, are quite vocal, predominantly white and um, the, the city really wanted to hear directly from community members without that outside input about what the issues were that were top of mind to them and what solutions they wanted to see. And so um, that's really a positive. They've already created two um, green justice zone projects that are underway. Um, one is along the, the waterfront near the Port of Providence. So that's this one is directly re related to stormwater. They're talking about improving and creating a stormwater management area right near the port and creating public access to the waterfront. So, you know, it's one little sliver of hope in that area, which has just been so degraded over the years. And I think there'll be more to come as, as the months and years go by, but it was a really great effort by the city and it's gotten a lot of positive feedback, so. Again, it's something that will continue to follow. But um, yeah, I, I hate talking, so I didn't want to like talk too long, but I wanted to open up to questions or, um, you know, like obviously just hear from you what's what's happening in, in, in your worlds because, you know, that's how we get our story ideas and it's usually reader tips. Yeah. How did, how did you keep the usual suspects out? How did that happen? I mean, free <laughs> Freedom of speech, I didn't have and to do it. <laughs> I mean, no, I know, I know you didn't. But how did they do that? I think what happened was they did they did hold public meetings, but they did individual outreach to community members just via phone calls. And so, you know, eventually it was open to the public, mm. um, but they did a lot of individual outreach ahead of those meetings. What's the uh, climate with uh, Governor Raimondo? Uh, how is she with the? Uh, with the environmental issues? Um, well, she has put forth an aggressive plan to shift the state's renewable energy, to increase the state's renewable energy portfolio. But I would say there's a lot of disappointment from the environmental community with respect mm -hmm. to her track record. She really pushed for um, a big power plant project in Boroughville, Rhode Island, which ultimately was uh, overturned it didn't come to fruition but it was like a three-year <laughs> a three-year battle um, that the environmental community waged to keep that project from coming online so um, you know she her priority tend is is pro business and pro jobs and when she came to office the economy in Rhode Island was suffering um, but I think Oftentimes, people don't see the link between the economy and the environment, <coughs> just, just like we all know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It looks like Henrietta has a question. Yeah, a, a question and a comment. Going, yeah. back, going back to your comment that the usual suspects didn't 
w didn't get to take over this project, mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention a, uh, a podcast, which is really quite extraordinary. It's called uh, Rich White Parents, I think. Oh, right. yeah, about the schools in New York. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and if, if anybody wonders, if, 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 if your liberal friends wonder what's wrong with white involvement in these kinds of projects, just listen to that blog and yeah, it's it's it out so yeah. excruciatingly. It's so it, it's it's a constant threat. Yeah, that, yeah, that the, nice, the nice quote white progressive man. white people will want to intrude and take over, and they will event end up taking over whatever the project is. So, just wanted to yeah. mention it. So yeah. along those lines, um, Joanna, what would be your suggestions for ways to be productively involved in these issues? Uh, um, so I, I'll answer for us and then maybe suggestions for advocacy groups. So, I mean, for us, um, a lot of it is trust in the community and covering the stories and showing up. Um, you know, again, like our staff is very small and we're all white. Our, our board is racially diverse, but our staff is, you know, we are all white and we're, you know, we're very conscious of this. And so really going in as a journalist with curiosity and open mind and not a, not a set idea of how you're going to frame a narrative. And oftentimes um, people in communities of color and environmental justice zones are hesitant to speak to the media. I mean, many people are, but I think there's a fear of the media that's, you know, well-founded. And so it's really just about showing your face, not impossible in these times, but showing your face and becoming not an ally because we're journalists, but a trusted, a trusted, um, organization in the community and just a place that people know they can go if they're seeing something that we're gonna we're gonna shine a spotlight but we're not going to push our own agenda on anything so it's it's hard work and um we as we've gotten more into it we started by meeting with leaders in the community just one-on-one -on -one. Um, again it kind of mirrors the way that the climate justice plan went about their work just meeting with, with people in the community who were leaders and listening to what the issues were establishing a line of communication and just reporting 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 so that has worked for us it's ongoing and it's hard work um, but that's the method that we've been using um, I think for advocacy groups, sort of the same. It's just about really listening and understanding what the issues are. And sometimes the issues aren't what we've been advocating for or thinking of all this time. It, it, or it's maybe an issue that's framed in a different way. Um, so I would just go into it with curiosity and empathy and... Um, not a set agenda if that makes sense i mean i don't know if you have specific work in mind that you're thinking of when you're asking that question i think uh, perhaps melissa has a comment yes well i just um i just wanted to share with everyone i, I you know coming from a tribal community who's underserved and you know, not really consulted on a lot of matters. I just wanted to read a quick couple of sentences from a press conference I did last week um, regarding big hydro coming through, um, down through the corridor. So we, we were talking about environmental justice and I just, I just wanted to read real quickly. You know, we, we talked about the destruct, destructive impacts um, on indigenous people's lives and the land and I wrote uh, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe 
knows this because we have been at the ground zero of colonial resource extraction for over 400 years. As I know well, indigenous people in New England are often overlooked or ignored with respect to matters of energy and resource development. Yet at the same time, uh, as a tribe whose ancestral homelands along with the forest fish and other wildlife in Plymouth was used by the pilgrims to serve their interests as colonists. So we know that we in our history as a tribe directly connected to the decisions that Massachusetts makes. So I just, you know, I, I think is if there's a way to bring a little bit more attention to tribal communities, you know, it right down to just the COVID, you know, we don't even have a category where we're considered other. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, they do these surveys and they they give you this data on online and it's 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 you know it's black, white, um, Hispanic or other. So it's just, you know, I just wanted to say that when we talk about these things, a lot of my mission is to figure ways to add the native voice to these to these conversation. So I just wanted to add that as we're talking about, uh, you know, social justice and um, environmental justice, I think it's really important to add that voice because it has not been heard um, for a long, long time. So, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah we, have, thanks. yeah. we actually have a reporter who's working on a story. She's trying to get um, input from uh, the Narragansett tribe with a respect to how they're how they're viewing some of the state's climate mitigation strategies um you know and um so yeah it can be again it's like you know the tribal people really have been erased like they're not you know the category is other and there's it's definitely um from a journalistic perspective like getting native peoples to to speak on the record it's incredibly challenging because there's been you know they've been taken advantage of and haven't you know their narrative has been buried for so long and so um yeah i would i would love to connect with you after this just to hear more about you know what you're doing and, um, joanna what's what's your readership what do you mean? Like how, how many? How, how, how many people do you reach with your uh, newsletter? Um, so our newsletter has 13,000 opt-in subscribers. So those are people who've signed up and it's free. And then more people come to our website, you know, usually if like somebody shares or social, via social media links. So we have an audience, a monthly web audience of about 30,000 people so it's good you know I, I don't know to what extent we're reaching beyond the choir uh you know I'm sure I'm, I'm you know I'm sure we don't climate deniers don't read us <laughs> but um but yeah we have a pretty good reach so we're you know well I want to I wanted to thank you for your informative talk it's always nice to hear oh. what other people are facing and reaching out to individual community leaders, I think was a, a great uh, idea that I'm going to take out of this. Uh, I know how difficult it is to do uh, real news reporting. Maybe you should switch to fake news. That's apparently easy. Uh, <laughs> we'd be more successful. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much. That's really kind. So do we have other questions and comments? Uh, Henrietta. Uh, yes, just one question about the lead pipes. Yeah. Is there, is there any mechanism to enforce uh, the replacement of red, lead pipes that's been, has it been mandated or has it just been suggested by the state? And is there any enforcement? I am not aware of any enforcement. I don't know if Topher has heard otherwise, but it's no. I mean, getting it, getting environmental regulations to be enforced in the state, and I'm sure also Massachusetts is just, <laughs> it's an uphill battle. But I'll look into that. That's actually an interesting question. If I find out anything, I'll email Dory to send to the group. It, I just want to um, sort of echo what Joe is saying. Um, environmental enforcement in Rhode Island has been 
whittled away and even gutted over the last decade plus. And it's really um, alarming. So we don't even have a, um, there's not even deterrence now. So, um, and I do think that that's actually a product of something else that Joe, you mentioned too, which is that uh, at, at state, at the state, highest levels of state government in the, in the legislature anyway, there's still a real disconnect between environment and economy and jobs. So they're seen as, um, as, as um, conflicting opposites. And um, th there is a, I think there's a growing number of um, public officials, candidates that are seeing it differently and, and see the two as, you know, as, as environmental, good, good environmental policy, including enforcement as being very good for our economy as well. Um, it's a deep rooted problem that we, we have to dig into over the long term. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and Don, let's go back to Don. Yeah, I have a, I have a suggestion, Joanna. I'm with yeah. the Herring, Herring Ponds Watershed Association. We recently did a, a survey, monkey survey, to find out expectations of our our constituency. Mm -hmm. And I think it would might be useful to all of you to find out the reach, the breadth, the bandwidth, so to speak, of of your um, of your constituency. Whether they're they're you are reaching other than just people who would naturally be concerned about this. And mm -hmm. you, might, you might even ask them what, uh, what you might do to extend your bandwidth. We had some great ideas from that survey oh, yeah. and uh, we're in the process of, of implementing them. So uh, that's an easy free, well, maybe not free at 13,000 level, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> a good, it's a good way to get input. So yeah, that's a great idea. So um, you mentioned a cold pile down there. Yeah. Is that is that related to you know the Brayton Point thing, or is that is it left over? Or is it active? What can oh, you Port of Providence. Um, it's sort of seasonal, <laughs> and wow. Topher probably knows better. I'd have to go back and review the story that we wrote, but um, you know, from time to time, coal is stored at the Port of Providence. It's it's not related to the Brayton Power Plant. It's so there's active right coal. until um, recently th there was a the last um, coal-fired plant in New England was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and the uh, Provport was sort of a staging area for coal to be sent down to that plant. But I think that's done. Is it um, done? That's good. I, I think so. Okay. Um, I haven't I haven't looked. We were neighbors to the port. We I, I haven't looked across the way in the last week or so on this. But anyway. Yeah, I, I haven't, you know, like, yeah, sometimes, like, you would pass by it and you'd see this giant pile of coal, like, in mm -hmm. the winter, but I haven't seen it this year, so maybe it's done. Maybe, we, maybe there's a cleanup story there. <laughs> the whole port I, I have to tell you all that, um, just a, a shout out to Joe and the team at, at uh, Eco Rhode Island, because they, uh, they are at every state house environment committee hearing, they are covering the big issues, the tough issues, and you do a really great job. It's a real oh, public thanks. service. Well, it's been easy because there haven't been any environment state house meetings in the last. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we'll get <laughs> there eventually. Over. Yeah, they will come back. Joanna, thank you so much for doing oh, this. We really appreciate thank it. You. It's, so, it's so good to hear from your group about what you're doing and just, um, you have my email seriously like if there's something going on please let us know we're only three reporters so yeah. we really really value um reader tips 